Good afternoon. And I've broken the microphone already. It's not going to work. Okay. I'll just shout. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Arthur for the very kind invitation to such a beautiful city and to be involved in this, this great meeting. Um, the second thing is uh, I'd like to, to say that following on from Professor Pena's talk, uh, I've got quite a hard shift here because that was excellent and I thoroughly enjoyed that. As a matter of interest, there are almost a thousand haematologists in England alone, not the UK, in England, which has a population of about 45 million. So, you know, we are quite well off. And the last thing to say before we started is that you might notice that I've taken liberty in changing the title. Um, yes, I will address how we treat uh, elderly myeloma patients, but I want to introduce some concepts for you to be thinking beyond that as to how we could actually treat these patients better using more precision medicine. These are my uh, disclosures, and as you'll see, I'm happy to take money from anybody. Why is age a problem? And, and you've already heard from Professor Pena about the issues in the Latin America, but globally, the over 80 year olds are going to quadruple by 2050. And therefore there is emerging, even in the developed countries, there is going to be an issue with looking after these patients going forward. And of course, in haematology, it's really very important when we look at age. And of course, you look at the, the median age of presentation that myeloma is only just second to CLL in that context. And in particular, if you look at the, the above 85 year olds, which are the red bars on the columns, you can see that they are, they are a not insignificant part of the myeloma practice. And of course, as you've heard from a number of speakers today, that how we deal with patients is based very much on a, a clinician eyeball assessment as to whether we think they are going to be eligible for a transplant, whether they will definitely not be eligible for a transplant, and then there's that group in the middle, which again, we've already talked about. And how we treat them depends on the availability of access to drugs, as well as ongoing clinical trials that I've highlighted along the bottom. But of course, what physicians want and what patients want are not necessarily the same thing. And individual patients' goals with treatment do vary with their age and their comorbidity and their social circumstances. And for the younger person, it's about depth of response. It's about longevity of life. The older person is about avoiding treatment toxicities and burden of treatments. And it's about quality of life and others in between. And it's finding that balance between the quantitative and the qualitative outcomes that are important. So on to a bit about how we treat. So as you know, daratumumab was myeloma's rituximab. Our lymphomania colleagues for years have been reveling in using a monoclonal antibody for therapy. And then along comes daratumumab after elituzumab, admittedly, but it has made a sea change. And of course, these are two pivotal studies, Maya with DRD versus RD, and I'll say on Dara VMP versus VMP. And you can see the uplift in outcomes there. This is survival. Just for, for completeness, quite often people talk about VRD in this setting of treating the non-transplant population. And much of that comes from the SWOG study illustrated here. And this was presented, this is an update presented by Brian Jury last ash, looking at the overall survival, progression-free survival. Progression-free survival is the A graphs and the overall survival is the, the B graphs. And what you can see from this it's very much in the older person, that differential isn't borne out. There isn't really a PFS or an OS advantage in this. And there are many reasons for that. And certainly the, the patient population in this study would be part of the reason to explain this. But what I've highlighted over on the side there, in particular, the overall survival. The overall survival of VRD in this study was about the same as the PFS in Maya. So we are talking about different things here. But of course, as we've already mentioned, that myeloma patients aren't homogeneous. They're very much a heterogeneous group, and particularly those older patients. And when we think about the natural aging process, which revolves around the accumulation of senescent cells, and the higher the senescent cell burden, the higher the comorbidities and the dysfunctionality. Well, 
That's the dissections along the bottom of this cartoon. But then you can add a myeloma accelerant. This is the disease overlay. The features that can drive and increase that accelerated aging process in a downward spiral to dysfunctionality and uh, frailty. But of course, it's not just about those biological features. Our treatments have an impact. So if we look at this fairly simplistic cartoon, so if we look at unfit patients, that some of them may well actually physically get better as you start to reduce the disease burden. But equally, some of those patients might become more frail because of the treatment burden issues. And the same goes for fit and uh, the frail population. And this is what we need to be mindful of. And as has already been introduced by earlier speakers, there is the IMWG frailty score, which is the gold standard by virtue of the fact it's the first score that was delivered and you know, printed and followed. And this was by seminal work led by Antonio Palumbo. There's been modifications, such as the middle column here. This was Terry Facong's uh, 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 modification, largely to allow you to apply it retrospectively to clinical trial data sets and or real world data sets, not meant to be a substitute for prescribing practices. And as another example, we have developed a vulnerability score in the UK, but there are many, uh, including colleagues from Germany, who have created the myeloma comorbidity index. So when we apply this, and this is using Thierry's modified version to the Maya data set, when we did this, we were able to basically dissect out the patients in this setting. So green are the non-frail group, and blue are the frail. And what you see is that the DRD in frail is actually considerably better than the RD in frail. And in fact, there's a trend, non-significant trend, to better outcomes in DRD frail than RD non-frail. I wouldn't read too much into that, but nonetheless, what it does show is you can deliver these triplet regimens in a relatively frail population. And going into this even further, and this was data that Philippe Moreau presented the IMS uh, meeting last year, and this was looking at dose modifications and drug delivery interruptions. And what you can see is that if you discontinue REV only, which is the far left column, or if you discontinue all three drugs in under 18 cycles in the middle column, or you continue, this is then looking at the frailty. And what you can see is that when you've got a higher level of frailty, you've got an increased level of drug discontinuations. And that can explain the survival curve differences. Now, there are many caveats to this data. It was an unplanned post-trial analysis, but it starts to open up questions about how we can and do deliver these therapies. And when we look at quality of life, which is really important, particularly in this, this age group, this is a, an interesting swim lane plot looking at the preservation of key elements of quality of life between DRD, which is blue, and RD, which is green. And what you can see is... Like, for example, physical functioning and role functioning is significantly better preserved in the DRD compared to the RD. But there are other things, for example, like cognitive and social functioning, where there is no difference. And that undoubtedly pays homage to the use of dexamethasone in this space. And for pain, it's not reached here, so the hazard, the hazard ratio is 0.66. So it does highlight that this is tolerable and can control disease and maintain quality of life. So what about the dexamethasone issue? And this is a very interesting study from a French colleague. This is the IFM 2017-03, where they compare RD with a steroid-free regimen of LEN and subcutaneous daratumab. And because this is, in a, a complete, this is just in the frail population, uh, Salomon Manny, who, who presented this an update at ICE last year, looked at the frailty as the score rather than in the frail bucket as a way of trying to tease things out. And that's really important, as we'll come back to in a little bit. But just to show you some data that Salomon presented last year, what you can see is that in the steroid-free, having a regimen that's steroid-free did not compromise uh, the efficacy of the regimen. But in actual fact, what it did is it showed better results. Is that because it had data? Or is it because that the lack of dexamethasone meant that patients were able to stay on the treatment unmodified and these questions will be answered as we start to go through it. And if I turn your attention to the forest plot on the right, 
The first box really is the IFM frailty score by score. And as you can see that the, the only point where DR, DR is significantly better than RD is for those with a score of two. When you start to move up to three and four and beyond, that difference starts to disappear a bit and becomes statistically non-significant. So what are the controversies we need to face in this space? Well, the first thing is the INWG frailty score as a tool is pretty blunt. By virtue of your 80th birthday, irrespective of whether you play seven rounds of golf a week and you go out to a bar every night of the week and are perfectly fit, you automatically become frail. So that's the difference of using age cohorting in clinical prediction models as opposed to a continuous variable. Then, of course, we have performance status included in there. The comorbidity index is used the Charleston, which was never designed for this purpose. Uh, and there are many variables in there. Um, and it is a good scoring system, but it gives you a prognostic index. It does not give you a predictive. What I mean by that is, at the moment, you can't and should not use that to deliver your treatment because there is no evidence base that it can be used for that purpose. It can only prognosticate. Um, and therefore, there may well be a danger that you might undertreat some patients who are categorized as frail under this system. And of course, then there's the last issue, which is, I'll come to towards the end, is can we modify physicality? This is a shameless plug for the Myeloma 14 fitness study, which is looking to actually determine whether the IMWG frailty score is a predictive biomarker and can be used prospectively to change how you deliver treatment. This is using IRD, and basically we have a control arm where the doses are modified reactive to toxicity, so standard of care delivery, versus upfront proactive dose modifications. And then we've got a second randomization of exazomib len versus placebo len as a maintenance strategy for all. This study needs to recruit uh, 740 patients, and as of this month, we have 702. So we will be finished recruitment before ASH. We have three related abstracts on some of the early demographic data uh, going to ASH, and hopefully that will, they will be accepted. Another thing about the frailty score is it's done at baseline. So the question is, is it dynamic? Now, this, isn't, this is a higher Amiens paper that was published just earlier this year. This is not using the MWG frailty. This is using a cumulative deficit index, which is an electronic frailty score most often used by geriatricians. But it can be applied to the SEER data set, which is what Hira did in this context. And what they found in this paper was your evolving frailty was more predictive of outcomes than your baseline frailty. And that pays to my cartoon earlier about removing that myeloma accelerant in that space. One of our abstracts going to ASH is actually looking at changes in the IMWG frailty score in the fitness study, which because of ASH's typical embargo, I can't show you any of that data, but it does look interesting going forward. What about in the relapse refractory setting? Um, this, <laughs> this was an ill-fated uh, phase 2b study that I ran uh, using exazomib cyclodex versus cyclodex. And I say ill-fated because what you see, the blue line is cyclodex and the red line is exazomib cyclodex and the cheap cyclodex did better than the ICD. And the reason for that is when you come onto the, uh, the right-hand forest plot is that that was largely driven by the number of people who were categorized as being frail. The point being is that in the older, frailer patient in the relapse setting, that triplet therapy may well be exceptionally difficult to deliver an impact on not only quality of life, but survivorship. And in addition to that, this is data from the Italian group published towards the end of last year. And this is looking at quality of life and symptoms in the relapse refractory setting. And the blue columns are frail patients. And you can see right across the board of the quality of life domains that the patients with, um, with frailty in the relapse refractory setting have a considerably poorer quality of life. And most of the symptoms in that space were more pronounced in that group of patients. So I've set the scene. So how can we do better in this context? And the first thing I'd like to challenge really is how we categorize people in terms of their frailty. This is work from Claudia Steger and uh, Sonia Zwiegman 
on the, the, the Hovon 143 study. And what they did was, similar to what Salomon Manier did, was actually look at categorizing people based on their score rather than their designated frail, unfit and frail, which is what you see on the right-hand side. And this was prompted by, they looked at all those who are frail to see whether they were judged as frail based on their age, which is the blue line, whether it was by others, such as comorbidity, which is the red line, or all of them, which is the green line. And you can see clearly that the people who were judged as frail based on their date of birth do segregate about, which is then uh, Claudia and Sonia did the analysis, as you can see on the right. So what they then said, well, okay, rather than using two and above to categorize you as frail, why don't we reset this and make it three and above? So the top is the original myeloma frailty index using two and above as frail. Frail is the red dotted line. And they recalibrated that with using three and above. And you can see in the bottom graph there that that separates out quite significantly between the frail, non-frail population. And the gray shading is the, is the confidence interval. So that makes it more significant. We have been looking at this in a bit more detail using our myeloma risk uh, score, the MRP. And what we did here was this is a real world data set. Is it, it's exploratory, but what we did is we took everybody categorized as being frail and then looked at their MRP risk. And as you can see, the frail column there, that in the frail column, there is about two thirds of the patients are MRP high risk, but not all. So what we then did is take frail people and said high risk versus non-high risk. And as you can see there, that the overall survival is different. And in the UK, pretty much everybody gets the same treatment because of how it's governed. And when we looked at it, the comorbidities were significantly different. They had this high risk frail population, had a lower hemoglobin, lower creatinine clearance, higher risk of having myeloma bone disease. So we are defining these as ultra high risk or ultra frail. And then we're looking to actually develop that as a principle. So this is just a little bit of early data. Turning to the laboratory, is there a way that we can have biomarkers that might actually differentiate? And this is us starting to get into the space of more precision medicine type approach towards these older patients. And you can do immune profiling, you look at body composition, has already been mentioned, sarcopenia is, is, is a way of looking at this. We are also interested in the adipose tissue distribution as a way. And then uh, more recently, we've been getting into cognitive assessment and neurocognitive imaging. So just taking you through that, this is just some early work that we've been doing, looking at senescent CD8 T cells, and they are represented at significantly higher numbers in frail patients compared to non-frail. If you look at the TEMRAs, that's the uh, effector memory re-expressing RA population, which is the older, tired T cells, then they are represented in myeloma patients significantly more than age match controls. So there may well be a disease process driving this. And when you look at CD4, CD8 ratios, again, we see differences in terms of senescent cell burden and TEMRAs. But of course, it would be naive in this context to be thinking about one test will actually do. And this is, uh, this is the, the ethos that underpins my multimodal, multidisciplinary research group in Leeds, and this is profileomics. It's amazing. If you make up a word and you slip it into an editorial, it becomes a thing. So it's now a thing. So this is what we do. We look at clinical prediction models using large data from uh, clinical trial vaults. We also use real world data. We've got a, a strand of research looking at med tech. Uh, you, we've got a study that's just opened to using wearables to actually look at performance status of older patients, a study called Transform. Um, as I said, we've got a cognitive frailty interface our immune profiling, which is our wet, wet science, including inflammatory proteomics. And then we have radiomics, where we take diagnostic cross-sectional imaging to look at myosteatosis, muscle mass, and combine that with adipose tissue distribution, subcutaneous versus visceral, as a way of actually trying to characterize people. And of course, you can't do any of this unless you're going to use AI algorithms to make it a functionality that will give you potential usability. And, and then lastly, I'd just like to talk about this, can we improve physicality? Um, and I'm not talking about this man here, 
who everybody knows as Lance Armstrong, who was prone to using drugs to performance modify. What I'm talking about is the arena of senolytics or senomorphic therapy. Just to, to, to introduce this a little bit more, senescence is the cellular response to DNA damage. So when there's damage, these cells switch off. They switch off their proliferative capacity. They are not inert. In fact, these are metabolically hyperactive and produce many chemicals that give rise to the inflammation associated with aging. But what happens is the immune system eliminates these and you get tissue repair. That's the physiological response. The pathogenic response is you get senescence, you don't eliminate them, and they accumulate, that gives you aging. And of course, in terms of the oncogenic response, you don't get the senescence. Senescence is supposed to protect you from developing cancer, and of course, one of the main stays of oncogenicity is the, the evasion of developing senescence. So that's one thing that's important. Second thing is, is that nicotinamide, adenine, a dinucleotide and its precursors are very important for mitochondrial function, cellular function, particularly immune cellular function. And as we get older, our mitochondrial function seems to drop away, which is the green line. And as a consequence, the blue line, which is NAD and its precursors, drop away in the microenvironment. And one of the reasons for this seems to be CD38, because the ectoenzyme capability of CD38 is to destroy NAD and its precursors. And that CD38 tissue distribution seems to increase with age. And this is some elegant work that was actually published a number of years ago, but basically, when you look at nicotinamide, adenine, dine, nucleotide and its precursors, then if you knock out CD38, which is the red graphs, you can significantly improve the microenvironment of these very active metabolites. Why am I telling you this? Well. The thing is, is that this is a study that was published using nicotinamide riboside, which is a neural supplement that can increase the microenvironmental concentrations of NAD and its precursors. And in this study, and they gave this to septuagenarians and octogenarians in health, I were able to demonstrate that not only could you suppress chronic mediators of inflammation, here IL-6 and TNF-alpha as an example, it also improved the metabolome, improved mitochondrial function, and did improve uh, the functionality of these patients uh, just with a month's course. So taking all that together, this is the Spectrum study that we're about to open in the UK. And what this is doing is <clears throat> using nicotinamide riboside plus metformin, which is also another senolytic, uh, to look on the backbone of DRD. Here the daratumab is a dual purpose in this study. One it's attacking the disease, which is what it's invented for. And two, it will be reducing the ectoenzyme capability of CD30 in tissues, and therefore, hopefully, improve NAD and precursors. And then RMB, we're going to add in an anti-IL-6. And the point of this study is to look at, at 300, sorry, 300, at three months, whether there is an improvement in IMWG frailty score, in physical functionality, quality of life, patient-reported outcomes, and a whole bucket load of translational research that we've got aligned to this study. We are in early discussions about ARM C in this, which is using uh, monolizumab, which is an antibody that blocks NKG2A. Now, NKG2A is an inhibitory receptor on NK cells and CD8 T cells, and it gets blocked by HLA-E. And HLA-E is highly expressed on senescent cells. So this is how senescent cells can avoid detection and elimination. So therefore, adding that in may well improve the, the removal. And this study will feed into our follow-on study from the Myeloma Fitness Study. This is IFIT. Uh, and this is currently at funder at the moment for consideration. And this is looking at taking patients through an introductory phase of DRD and then based on MRD, uh, outcomes, we're going to take the MRD positives into a T-cell engager, uh, and in this context, it's teclistimab, but we're going to add into the frailty arm the senolytic therapy in the hope that we can actually take some frail patients and move them into this more advanced consolidation maintenance strategy for the older person. So, what have I really been saying? Well, 
the treatment landscape has improved significantly for the non-transplant eligible population. And with that, we then need to start to think about one size does not fit all, and therefore, how can we construct our treatments moving forward? Can we improve physicality? There are many things that I haven't been able to, because of constraints of time, introduce into this, but nutrition and exercise are very important in this population, and that's going to be, along with pharmacocytic therapy, help to improve functionality of these patients going forward. And this is based around using host response biology to generate a more precision medicine approach. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. This is me in November, September of last year, where I cycled from London to Paris to raise money for Myeloma UK, the UK patient charity, uh, and also to raise awareness for myeloma. It also represented me 18 months after major cancer surgery and chemotherapy, so it was a bit of a personal win. Thanks very much. Um, you express um, the phrase immunosenescence, and as you well know, uh, let's say a smoldering uh, multimyeloma, if we could say so. There is a theory that it develops toward open, uh, open over the multimyeloma in parallelism of immunosenescence, of immunodecadency. And a lot of drugs we are using in multimyeloma have a target of immune system, the blocking as the checkpoints inhibitors, the blocking of T cells, which work very well. Do you think the experience in immunotherapy for multimyeloma could help us in general oncology to use immunotherapy uh, therapeutic approach? Uh, well, first thing to say is that, and again, I didn't have time to go into this, but we have data looking at immune profiling in MGUS, smoldering as well as myeloma. And MGUS is not an immunologically inert condition. There is a higher level of, of, of pro-inflammatory uh, markers within that system, although the, the cellular side of things is normal. And when you get into smoldering myeloma, you start to see changes in those. So they're already happening. But you're right, when you move from smoldering into myeloma, you actually see quite a significant loss of, of, of tumour control, basically. So I think that's a very important sort of paradigm to be thinking about interactions of the immune system and cancer per se. To answer your question, yes, I think there's a lot that we haematologists know about the immune system and interplay with, with blood cancers that could be utilised by our colleagues in solid cancer field. Uh, and we are now starting to see more and more collaborations along those lines. Let's be, I mean, solid organ oncologists believe immunotherapy is checkpoints. Now they're starting to realise, actually, no, that's just the start of things. And they're now starting to look at the idea of CAR T cells and T cell engagers. And those products already exist, but they don't know how to use them. So they will look towards us as haematologists to, to show them. And there is a lot of academic work in the background that will help to underpin that. So, no, I completely agree. Yes, uh, I am also very impressed with your lecture. Congratulations. Actually, uh, you mentioned on the nicotine amide, uh, on the immune profiling, the uh, inflammaging immunosenescence and all this very important issue. Well, what is your opinion? Because uh, many epidemiologic studies point out vitamin D as one of the crucial uh, element in the immunologic status of the patient, uh, uh, apart from the uh, viruses, CMV, EBV, uh, the vaccination status. What is your opinion on the a recommended level of vitamin D as well, K2, uh, perhaps, in this uh, assessment of the frailty of the patient. So again, because of time, I only showed a snapshot of what we've been doing, which is the CD8 T cells. It gets very much more complicated when you look at even CD4 T cells within, without, without actually looking at B cell compartment and how it works. And again, it would be naive to think that a single facet of immune profiling would give you what you need to know. There is a, a very elegant study that was done in nonagenarians that looked to develop an immune signature 
that did revolve around the presence of, of uh, CD8 T cells that were senescent, yes. But it starts to bring into the whole business about CMV seropositivity, chronic viral infections in that aging population, and paying a bit more homage to the evolution of immune senescence across all the elements of the immune system. So I think it would be naive of me to try and propose T cells are going to give the answer. But it's more about looking at a snapshot that would be, you know, would, would be representative of, of that group of individuals. But there is no doubt that the, the chronic inflammation associated with advanced age is driving a lot of problems, not just in the immune system. That's the sort of the immunometabolic side of things. And of course, a lot of that comes from the adipose tissue, which is one of the largest endocrine organs we have as humans. And the sort of pre-adipocytes are the ones that are senescent as we get older, and they're the culprits. They're the ones that are firing all sorts of cytokines and chemokines that are speeding up that natural senescence in the immune system across the board. There is so much we don't understand about this, so we've only just started to get into that area as haematologists. Yes, thank you. I know Professor Skotnitsky used thymus factors, some thymus factor for many years. Uh, do you think some thymus factor can improve or would be helpful the uh, now, patient with the... Nowadays experience suggests that we are right. Uh, immunotherapy involving immune system to fight against the cancer is absolutely now accepted by the whole world. There are different methods, as you know, the blocking or stimulating or by specific antibodies. All of them are focusing of T cells, and we are all here free of, from cancer because we have very good T cells. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think the T cells are, are fundamental to the elimination of the precancerous cell, to the controlling of the, the cancer cells that starts. And it's loss of that T-cell control that then gives us symptomatic cancer. There's no doubt about it. There is a bit more to play in this because cancers themselves can evade detection, but also some cancers, and myeloma is a classic example, as is melanoma and renal cell cancer, they actively suppress the immune function. So there are many ways that we can help the immune, the flailing immune function in patients with myeloma, for example, to try and make it better then you've got to do that if you're going to be using drugs like T-cell engagers because they don't improve that inbuilt deficit mechanism. They take the T-cells as is and drive them forward, which is why I think the biggest limitation to T-cell engagers is going to be driving exhaustion. So we kind of need to improve the microenvironment, the immune microenvironment, ahead almost of giving T-cell engagers. Otherwise, we will run into this exhaustion quicker than we imagine. And when we start using T-cell engagers in real world, we're going to see that more readily than what is there in the, the company-run studies, I think. Thank you very much. We have to go on. Thank you. Um,